Future Ethics event of the academic year. Uh, my name is John Meyer. I'm a, on the faculty of the College of Operational and Strategic Leadership here at the college. And I want to welcome you all to this conference. Uh, I'd like to have a special welcome for our incoming class of students. Uh, can I see by hands who are, the, who are the new students? Very good. Welcome. Um, there, I do promise you that the weather does get better here in Newport in May. But we're glad to have you here. Also, a welcome to our foundation members. We're very glad that you braved the elements to come and join us today for the conference. And thanks for your continued support from the Naval War College. Um, a notes about, uh, I know you've, uh, most of you, I hope, have seen the schedule of events for today. Just to review it briefly, uh, uh, Mar Dr. Martin Cook, our uh, Stocktail Chair for Professional Military Ethics, will be kicking things off by the framing of the, uh, the issues that we're going to be discussing over the course of these three days. He'll be followed by Dr. Don Snyder talking about strategic leaders and stewards of the profession of arms. Um, and then there'll be some dialogue between Dr. Cook and Dr. Snyder. Uh, that will take us to lunch. Then following lunch, Dr. Andy Basevich will be here to talk about the failure of U.S. national security policy. And then we'll have the seminar discussions this afternoon. I hope you all know where your seminar assignments are. Uh, for our foundation folks that are interested in participating in a seminar, we will be just down the hallway at the chairman's classroom if you would care to participate in a seminar. Um, I do want to remind you that everything um, in the conference is for attribution, uh, and we're taping uh, the speakers. Uh, and part of the reason that we're doing that is that <clears throat> we want to get the content of this conference out to our distance education curriculum. Um, you may or may not know that we have uh, upwards of 50,000 people enrolled in the Naval War College programs. Hard to imagine. You get you know, a couple hundred sitting here in Newport. Um, and so this is a way for us to, to uh, export the contents of this conference out to the many thousands of people that are taking War College courses around the world. So we are taping it. It is for attribution. Just a reminder, uh, the standard reminder about cell phones and pagers and all that stuff, please silence them and turn them off. And I'd appreciate that. Okay. Professional ethics. It's the foundation of the military profession. Our fellow citizens have entrusted us with enormous power and responsibility. Throughout history, strong militaries have been a continuous threat to civilian rule, and more than a threat. In many nations, and many times, that threat has been executed, and civilian and democratic rule has been supplanted by military takeover. Our founders were deeply aware of this history. For them, the example of Rome loomed large. What had begun as a republic led by the, a Senate became, with Caesar's crossing of the Rubicon, an empire ruled by a single emperor. Once that line was crossed, Rome was ne never recovered her civic traditions. It was for that reason that our Constitution recognized as standing military forces only the Navy, which did not threaten the government, and the dispersed military power of the individual state militias. It is also the reason that the fundamental obligation of American officers is to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution itself, the fundamental structure of civilian government. The Cold War required a change in the size and composition of America's standing military forces. It was that necess necessary change that caused President Eisenhower to warn exactly 50 years ago of the dangers to democratic government that what he called the military industrial complex posed to our republic, and calling for an alert and vigilant populace to stand guard against those dangers. Besides 50 years of experience since Eisenhower's warning, we are also a nation at war. In fact, we have been at war for a longer continuous period of time than ever in our history. 
And the kinds of wars we're engaged in are of particularly corrosive sort. Difficult deployments to environments where there is no behind the lines, sanctuary of relative safety. For most of you, those deployments have been multiple, and further ones almost certainly lie in your future. It was a realization of the stress on the force that caused our chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Mullen, to convene an unprecedented conference at the Naval National Defense University just last month. He called together retired flag and general officers, experienced civilian leaders, and military educators from all levels of the professional military education system. In his words, to begin a conversation and debate about who we are, what we have become, how that matches up to who we should be while we are in our 10th year at war with no immediate end in sight. He went on to note, our consciences get pierced by events which hurt us badly, and then the realization of what we've become, and then we fix it. Admiral Mullen further stated starkly, America doesn't know its military, and the United States military doesn't know America. But he admonished the conference. We cannot afford to be out of touch with them. And to the degree we are out of touch, it's a very dangerous course, we cannot survive without their support. Therefore, he asserted, my measure, my single measure is, how does this affect our relationship with the American people? Because in the end, that's the one that matters. One specific danger, he noted, is that too frequently we don't send that apolitical view and reminded the groups in the strongest of terms that only an apolitical military can sustain the connection and trust with the American nation. We gather here in Newport to take up the chairman's challenge. We will renew and deepen our understanding of the nature of our profession and the foundation of our ethic. We will examine carefully our role in a system of constitutional government. We will look at our obligations in war and peace that shape and condition our relationship of trust with the nation. Part of Admiral Mullen's motivation for concern was his own early experience as an officer of the Vietnam era. Then we experienced a low point of the competence morale of our military forces. Even more seriously, we lost the trust and confidence and therefore the support of, a large, of large segments of the American public. It is only prudent and realistic to recognize that this extended period of war could easily erode some or all of that in our contemporary military and in our relationship with the American people. So far, America continues to trust and support us. But to what extent is that partially, at least, because so few of them are directly connected to us. It is important that we understand clearly our role in our society, both its demands and its limits. It is critical that we police our own internal ethical and professional health, all the more so because we recognize the past 10 years have inevitably placed strains upon it. We have been able to invite a superb group of speakers for the next three days. I would encourage you to listen carefully, to question them carefully, and to use your seminar time as an opportunity to engage each other as professional colleagues so that you, may, you emerge from the War College experience more deeply grounded in your profession and your understanding of your role in the American experiment as a democratic republic committed to constitutional government. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Martin Cook, our Stockdale Professor of Professional Military Ethics, who will introduce and frame the questions for this year's conference. Dr. Cook. Uh, what I want to do for 45 minutes or so is just give a general overview of uh, the themes that we're going to pursue and tell you a little about each of the speakers. Uh, for those of you who are here in August, uh, this will be a little bit of repetition from what I said at convocation, but since we've had two new classes come in, it'll be new for many of you, so uh, we'll proceed with that in order. Um, grab the clicker here. Um, 
One thing I wanted to think about is, as students of the War College, you're obviously advancing in rank. And one of the things I think we need to think carefully about at the War College is that ethics actually begins to look a little different as you become more senior in the military. Um, my friend George Reed, who is a retired Army colonel, pointed out that when there are ethical failures, so-called, in the military, there are typically about three solutions that people think of. You fire the leadership, you mandate more training, and you put in a new policy. Um, and that, that's supposed to fix pretty much every ethical failure. Um, but in fact, pretty often, what drives ethical failure is none of those things. Uh, sometimes it's a systemic problem. My favorite and simple example of this uh, is when I worked for the Army and General Shinseki came in uh, as Chief of Staff, he uh, called up to Carlisle, the War College, and said, I need some colonels to study the readiness reporting system because I know that there is, I have no idea how ready the Army is because it's impossible for a company commander to report anything below C2. If they try it, it'll, it'll be pencil whip by higher headquarters. Uh, so it would be, is, the, is the company commander who reports inaccurately that there are C1 or C2 lying? Well, in some narrow sense, yes, they're speaking an intentional and deliberate untruth. Uh, but that would be a pretty superficial analysis of what's actually going on here, right? What's going on here is that the system is driving behaviors that make it inevitable that they behave in this way. And so um, as you become more senior, these issues of owning the system, thinking about the ripple effects of the system, and thinking about the complexity of what's really going on become more critical. And if we haven't done anything to prepare your critical thinking skills about ethics as you advance to that level, then you'll be ill-equipped to cope with them. One reason that they become so complex is because what I like to call the web of obligations that you have gets so much more complex. Um, when you're a junior leader, you're pretty much responsible for your department, your unit, your company, whatever your small unit is, and, and your loyalties upward go to your immediate next commander. But as you rise in rank, it all gets much more complex. So if you go to the other end of the system, you think about the kind of things Admiral Mullen is worrying about. He's worried about the health of the entire military profession 10 years from now. He's worried about the relationship that the military has with the Congress. He's worried about the relationship with the American people, as fuzzy as it is. And one of the reasons that he and I, who, who uh, came of age in the Vietnam era, are, worry about that so much is because we remember how bad it can get. Uh, I went to college as a freshman in 1969. Those of you who remember your history remember that. That spring was the Cambodian invasion and the Kent State killings. Um, I got an A in logic because it was impossible to go to class after midterms because of the riots on campus. It was not safe to walk across campus in an ROTC uniform. So if you don't think that the American people can lose trust in us, uh, I'm here to tell you I've seen it and it's not pretty. And so uh, you need to be thinking about even those time frames, those decades long time frames and those very large societal issues. Um, okay. So if that's true, we need to help you to provide an intellectual framework that can help you think through those kind of problems, one that's sufficiently subtle and complex to cope with that level, rising level of complexity. Um, it needs to be expansive enough to capture all of the new things that are gonna arise for you. And most importantly, and this is a thing I've learned a lot from our next speaker, Don Snyder, uh, in thinking about it, it has to be something that's truly distinctive to the military profession. Um, so often when we're being lazy, we borrow models from business or from academia or from other things that aren't, are not military specific. And it's very important that you think through your profession, not what's analogous from other things, unless that's particularly helpful, but it needs to be grounded in the realities of military experience. So one question that Don posed almost 10 years ago is, are military officers merely obedient bureaucrats or are they professionals? And why would that matter? Why would it matter to think about uh, the, that question in that way? Clearly, all of us who work for the DOD work for a very large bureaucracy, so it can't be an either-or problem. We're all embedded in a bureaucracy. But is there a distinctively professional element to what's going on? One way to think about this is, in the West, historically, there were only three occupations that were truly professional activity. It's important to raise this kind of technical definition of the term because in the modern world we use the word professional to mean anything people do for pay, right? But it has a more concrete and specific sense if we take the older tradition. 
those three professions were clergy, medicine, and law. Here I'm talking about the early modern period. Um, now, can anybody see what those three things have in common that distinguish them from other things people do for a living? You have microphones, by the way, if you push the button, if you're new, uh, please, if you're willing to play, it'd be, like to be, start interacting right away. What do what are those three things have in common? Confidentiality. Confidentiality. Good. What else? Please. They're self-regulating, good. They have their own internal um, policing. Say a little more about in what way they're self If you could push the button on the mic, that would be great. Oh, not working, okay. Good. Did everybody hear all that? He said, look, the professions regulate themselves, doctors discipline and regulate other doctors. How did they get that deal, by the way? They got that deal because the society entrusted it to them, right? Can they lose the deal? Absolutely, Absolutely right? Um, look, for example, what happened to accountancy after Enron, right? A good deal of the independent autonomy of, the, of accountancy got taken away because of the loss of social trust. Or look what happened to the Navy after Taylor. For example, sir, you had a point? I was gonna say, they also have some kind of a, like a qualifying process, like the lawyers have the bar that they have to pass. Good. And the same thing with doctors and clergy. Good, good. All right, anybody else? They have their own body of technical knowledge, right? which is acquired over a long period of time. right? Uh, it's called abstract knowledge as opposed to concrete knowledge because it's not just like the kind of knowledge that you can get in training. It's something that the professional applies with discretion, right? So when I go into my doctor's office and say, it hurts here, doc, she's immediately starting to do a very complicated process in her head called differential diagnosis, right? It hurts here could be this, could be this, could be this. If I do this test, I'll eliminate this. And there's no script to follow except in the most ordinary and routine kind of things, right? There are judgments being made at every stage of that process, being, being made according to, to the kind of built-in knowledge and experience that she's acquired over a long period of time, right? Um, okay. So one thing that makes them distinctive is they provide a service that's deemed essential to the society. If you think about those three, clergy, medicine, and law, in terms of the values of their time, what do they provide? Justice, health, and salvation. In terms of the values of the time, the most most important things, arguably, the society is concerned with. So there are, uh, there are occupations of a high degree of trust about something the society really, really cares about. Um, we've talked about this already. They have a highly developed technical knowledge and also usually a quite a bit of jargon that's incomprehensible to outsiders. Um, someone wants to define professions as conspiracies against lay people. Um, uh, but the, the reasons for the jargon, apart from the conspiracies against lay people problem, is because they make very precise distinctions that wouldn't make sense to it if it were spoken only in lay language, right? So it's important to have that developed. And they have behaviors that are expected. Uh, and a lot of the learning of the behaviors is brought about very, very informally, right? Just picking up the signals by participating. I used to teach in a medical school. It was fascinating to watch a bunch of residents or even interns padding around after a, an attending physician, just sort of watching how they behave with patients, right? That's kind of how they learn it. Nobody tells them explicitly a good deal of that stuff. They pick it up on the way. We've already talked about this. They make discretionary judgments using their abstract knowledge to apply to new problems. And, um, We've already talked about autonomy and self-discipline, the point that was made up here in the front. Um, we've talked about the fact that they set standards for entrance and promotion. Talked about the high degree of trust. Another thing about this body of abstract knowledge that's worth thinking about is uh, it's not a static possession. What would you think of a physician who said, uh, I was taught how to do this surgery in medical school in 1985, and it was good enough then, it's good enough now. Does everybody see that would be a failure of professional ethics, right? 
What is the ethical requirement here? The ethical requirement is to keep up on the journals, right? Keep up on the literature. Make sure you understand what's evolving in terms of the, the, the standard of practice in the community. Uh, make sure that you're anticipating the next thing that you may have to cope with, even though it's not in your existing repertoire of knowledge, right? You may realize you may need to go out and get it because you can foresee that something's coming down the road that is in your domain of practice that the society is gonna expect you, when, when you get there, to know how to cope with. Right? And if, if you get there and say, well, I, I, didn't, I didn't, wasn't taught that in school, say, well, but part of what a good professional does is anticipate what's coming, see what's coming. Okay, now, a lot of this discussion got renewed in the military thanks to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Snyder. Um, as I mentioned, Don was teaching at West Point, and he'll mean narrate some of this in his own talk, but he heard the young uh, lieutenants, West Point grads, coming back to West Point about, during the Balkan operations and saying, I tell my guys that force protection is the number one job while we're over here. And this got Don worried that mission accomplishment somehow was taking a back seat to force protection, and that that was a serious loss of the professional ethic and so uh, Don got a grant to run a project, which has b ballooned into a couple of very important books, uh, and got the Army really talking about this. So I don't know if you've been following what's happening in the Army, but this year in the Army is the year of, of the professional ethic. They've created a new center for the Army profession and ethic. Uh, the Chief of Staff has signed off on this. Some of this is embedded in, in doctrine now for the Army, which, as you know, is a big deal in the Army. Um, and so uh, Don has really got this conversation going in the Army, and one of the things we're going to talk about over the course of this morning is, where are the other services with respect to this question? Um, and are there cultural barriers to the other services having the same kind of conversation that has been going on in the Army? And if so, what can we do about that? Um, that's uh, the main theme for the morning, really. This is uh, the first of Don's book. This is an excellent collection of essays um, by, I don't know how many scholars in there, maybe 40 or 50, Don, something like that? 38 in total. Um, when I was teaching at the Air Force Academy, I taught a capstone course for the honors students, and we read a good deal of this book, and the, the students kept complaining, why are you reading this Army book? Because I said, show me the Air Force equivalent of it, and we'll read that. Um, um, and that shut them up fairly quickly, because there is no Air Force equivalent to that. Um, so that's a challenge. So the point of all this is this. If this analysis of professions is correct, then professional ethics is much broader than we, what we often think ethics is. Um, I have the privilege of talking to the major command course across the base here. Um, and what those officers, O6s, think ethics is, is a couple of things. They associate with the ethics brief that we all get every year, which is something that the lawyers give you, right? Which is really a talk about the so-called Ethics in Government Act. Or they think of it as what the IG tells them has been caught and punished in the service recently, right? And those are important things, obviously, but those are basically fairly narrow and legal things, right? Uh, but if we think about it through the lens of professionalism, in the sense in which I've defined it, then all kinds of things become ethics issues that are not obviously ethics issues in the way we normally think about it. Think of the example I just gave you. Your own intellectual development, your own broadening of your understanding of what you do, becomes an ethics requirement. Does everybody see that? Think of my analogy with the doctor, right? If you're not keeping up, you're not adapting, you're not learning, the mere fact that uh, you're just doing what you were trained to do in a previous life is not good enough. So one of the reasons that a profession has a war college is because of the belief that this is very important. In fact, if you think about it, I don't know any other profession that sends its best members to school as often as the military does. No other profession sends people to school this often, right? And that must mean that somebody somewhere believes that this intellectual development of officers is very, very important. So think about this. What would you say about somebody who is lo honest, loyal, and diligent, but incompetent? <laughs> Does everybody see that if through this lens, you'd have to say of such a person that they are professionally unethical? They could be the nicest people in the world, but if they're not skilled at doing what their, the, the shingle says their profession says they can do, then that's an ethics failure. Or 
Someone who's intellectually lazy, I've already developed this theme, who's not engaged in the intellectual development of the body of professional knowledge, is per se unethical. Or a profession that fails to adapt in the face of objective evidence that they need to. Uh, a recent example that fascinates me has come out of the medical side again. Has anybody seen this uh, book that's floating around called The Checklist Manifesto? There's a surgeon who did a study to show, absolutely, definitively show, that if surgeons would simply use a written checklist, they would dramatically reduce the number of surgical errors, like things left inside bodies and things like that. Uh, surgeons have turned out to be extremely resistant to using checklists, because they have a culture of, hey, I'm a surgeon, I don't need that, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm God, I'm in control of all this. So here you've got a profession shown objectively, demonstrably, that they could be better at what they do with a simple change in their behavior, and they don't want to do it. Right? Now, I'm not picking on surgeons. All professions are like that, right? They're, they're wedded to a way they've been doing it, and they're resistant to change. But at certain point, when the evidence is staring you in the face that you need to adapt, you got no option, right? Uh, General McMaster was here last spring. I'll quote him in a little bit. He would say, in many ways, this is the story of the army in Iraq. It went in not wanting to adapt and resisting adaptation for quite a long time. And finally, in the face of what appeared to be considerable failure, felt a need to do it. Failure to serve the client's interests is itself an ethical failure. Why do professions exist? To serve the needs of the client. OK, so this is what General McMaster had to say here last spring. Anybody want to react either to his assertion or to my claim that, that this really is an ethics failure? Any thoughts about that? OK. OK, now, another component of professions is that they have their own ethic. Some of that is internal, how they behave among themselves, but some of it is how they behave when, they, when they're doing their professional activity. And one dimension of that that has evolved, uh, has a deep tradition in the West, is how you fight a war is itself an ethical requirement. Uh, and that tradition has evolved as what's called the just war tradition, or the just war theory. Um, we, you, we'll be talking about it some in your core course. We'll have an opportunity to talk in this conference about specifically one element of it, which I'll talk to you a little about in a moment. This uh, moral tradition exists in two forms. Um, in one form, it exists as law. Uh, that emerged basically after the Protestant Reformation, uh, because before the Protestant Reformation, this tradition had largely belonged to the church. It was a religious tradition. But after the religious division of Europe, it became obvious to thoughtful people like Hugo Grotius that um, a religiously based just war tradition would no longer have, be, have general applicability across Europe because different Christian traditions were at work here. So Grotius began to develop a version of just war, which he, call, which he grounded in what he called natural law, the kind of thing that people, all rational people ought to be able to figure it out. And he said, it's critical that this be valid even if God doesn't exist. Because we're not going to get religious agreement about this, but we may be able to get some kind of legal framework in place that we can agree about. So that evolves as the Hague and Geneva Conventions, uh, and most of which is incorporated in national military manuals of, of manuals around the world and so forth. However, it's important to note that although this legal tradition is very important, and you all get a brief on it every year, and that's, that's critical, there are times when it's important to remember there is this older legal, this older philosophical tradition that lies behind it. Why? Because law is always a snapshot photograph of an evolving tradition. Um, and so as war evolves, as circumstances change, all kinds of novel things emerge that are not clearly covered by existing law. Um, over time, at least customary international law may sort this out, but that takes a while. So uh, one of our talks at this conference will be on new military technologies, things like uh, unmanned vehicles, like robotics, like hu human performance enhancement. Uh, what are the ethics of all of those kinds of technologies which 
will be changing the face of war or doing so visibly before our eyes, uh, and yet uh, require thinking it through. So we'll need to go back to this older tradition to think about it. One of your assigned readings, as you know, for this conference is a couple of chapters of Brian Oren's book, The Morality of War. Um, and I'll say a little about that in a minute. Um, he, Brian is from Toronto, so we're working the possibility that he's going to give this talk by a video teleconference because uh, the weather in Toronto is worse than it is here. So uh, we'll see how that all evolves. Okay, um, one issue that emerges if you begin to think about yourselves as professionals, uh, as I've suggested that you should, is uh, inevitably the question arises, then how much professional autonomy should you think that you have? For example, there are things that you would hope that a good physician would not do, even if you requested it, right? The jargon would be, it's not medically indicated, right? Yes, I could do it, but it would be, in my medical judgment, inappropriate to do this, right? Or there are things that a good lawyer would say, um, I, you know, I, I can't do that. There are rules of evidence, for example. I cannot withhold this evidence from the other side because there are disclosure rules that require that I present it. Um, and military people who have this dual hat of being military lawyers or military doctors feel this tension very, in a very lively way in their daily practice. The question that will arise, though, is what about uh, simply a, a line officer, a, a regular member of the military who doesn't have this second hat they can appeal to, right? Uh, I, I can't appeal my medical hat or my legal hat. I, I'm just a military officer, but now you're telling me I'm a professional. Are there similarly things that people could ask me to do that I should refuse to do because they violate my own professional ethic or violate my own professional understanding of what's militarily appropriate, right? Didn't you say that there was such a thing as professional expertise? And isn't it important that military officers give professional military advice to civilian leaders? Well, is it not the case that you may give excellent professional military advice to leaders and they will choose not to follow it? Of course it is the case, right? And when that happens, what should give, right? And so you, you're reading a, a piece by Lieutenant Colonel Milburn that was published in JFQ that argues for one position on this. Uh, if Dr. Cohn gets here from North Carolina um, tonight, Dr. Cohn has a very different view of that matter. But it's very important that we think about it because we've seen a lot of tensions around this just in recent years. Uh, think, for example, of uh, the so-called revolt of the generals that happened uh, under, under Secretary Rumsfeld, where six very recently retired, very senior officers called for the resignation of the Secretary of Defense. Now, admittedly, they were retired officers, not serving officers. Um, and Don will say quite a lot about the place of retired officers in the system. Are they still part of the profession and aren't they? Uh, and so forth. But in any case, that was a pretty unprecedented thing. And these were not just you know, guys who retired 20 years ago. These are guys who retired recently from positions where they had certain knowledge of how the Rumsfeld plan for executing the war in Iraq and Afghanistan was going. Or another example, uh, General Keene. He's scheduled to speak here in the spring. Um, and we have a culminating ethics event in the spring. Right now, he's on the schedule. He gave a very good talk at Fort Leavenworth a year ago in which he described in detail what he did as a recently retired vice chief of staff of the Army. And he says, look, I'm watching television one night, and I'm looking at the Iraq situation. I think, we're losing, and I've got to do something about this. So he gets on the phone to the American Enterprise Institute and a few other people, and, and they engineer a way around the Secretary of Defense, the Army staff, and practically everybody else in the chain of command to engineer the surge in Iraq, which, as you know, was successfully implemented because they got directly to the president with it. But General Keene is quite frank about the ethical irregularity of what he was doing. Right? I mean, he was exercising professional judgment, no longer in a position of any responsibility. Uh, to change the policy. And by the way, he also said in that talk um, that once he'd persuaded them, they asked him to come back in uniform and lead the effort, and he turned them down, frankly, because he was making too much money. Uh, so he said, you know, what, what, and, and so he's very clear that what I did here was very ethically uh, murky. Um, and uh, if you want to criticize me for it, he'll say, fire away, I mean, it's, I'm fair game. Or General McChrystal's recent firing, I mean, not, not really a challenge along professional military opinion in any overt way, but one, one suspects the disrespect being shown to the vice president, the president by his staff, which he didn't discipline, 
had to do with some policy disagreements, uh, which uh, caused them to want to make fun of the president and so forth. Um, so, uh, Secretary Gates said this recently. Let me let, read it. So, in case you haven't noticed, we're kind of out of money, right? Um, so, there are going to be major food fights over money. Um, that's inevitable. That's going to put a lot of ethical pressure on senior military leaders to give honest professional advice about what to do with constrained budgets. Because the default is always to defend every procurement program that you got, right? Uh, even before it became as obvious or as hurting as we were, um, about five years ago, if you woke up any Air Force general in the middle of night, the first words out of their mouth would have been F-22. Right? And they hung in with that to the point that eventually we lost a secretary, uh, a secretary of the Air Force and a, and a chief. Now, it's true they lost some nukes, too. That was part of the problem. But, um, um, but, uh, but I don't think that was actually the cause. I think the cause was that they were unwilling to get with the policy that said, we're not buying more F-22s. Um, so it'll be an interesting question. Is every service going to behave like that? Uh, to the point that it requires firing leadership so you can get people to cooperate? Or can people rise above it and say, part of my professional military advice is to accept the budget constraints, and then, then within those budget constraints, give my best advice about what we need to be, do, and acquire? That's going to be a big challenge in the next few years, and you guys are going to have to manage that, right? That's going to be pretty much on your watch. Um, so, if you've been following my argument up till now, I'm suggesting all of these things are part of professional ethics. What you're going to do in JMO, for structure and campaign planning, that's an ethics issue. It's how to use your professional expertise to bring it to bear on a novel problem that requires you to apply your expertise with uh, discretion to how to plan this campaign or how to structure your service so as to be relevant to foreseeable future challenges. That's an ethics challenge. Or the promotion system. Who gets, we said that, that professionals decide not only who gets in and out, but also they get to decide who gets to become the leader of the profession, right? Deciding who's the leader of the profession becomes very critical because, as people like to say, ducks tend to pick ducks, right? And if you need a new kind of leader than the ones that are presently in power, what is the mechanism by which those people come to realize they need to pick something other than a duck? Um, not easy for anybody, right? But it, does everybody see it would be a professional obligation if the objective need for leadership of the profession is different than what you were, it's going to be time to adapt. Uh, again, I'll pick on the Air Force just a little bit because, you know, it, since the 70s, the Air Force has been run by fighter pilots. Um, it's pretty clear, I think, that the single-seat fighter is not going to be the lead weapon system of the Air Force in the future. Not sure what is, but Secretary Schwartz, for the first time, is a special operator transporter, right? So the first chief of the Air Force since the 70s, who's not a fighter pilot. So something's shifting around here. Or look what happened with the Army promotion system when they put General Petraeus in as head of the promotion board. Officers got promoted who probably wouldn't have gotten promoted under the old system. Perhaps Don will say some more about that. Um, I've already talked about the civil-military relations problem, which I think is big and likely to get worse. Um, and really requires a lot of thought, so that's why we've got a, a good deal tomorrow if everything works out weatherwise, uh, with uh, uh, Colonel Milburn and, and, and Dr. Cohn discussing that. And then the role of military professionals in policy making. Um, you know, you give professional military advice, but th that sounds simpler than it is. Uh, how do you give it? How forcefully do you give it? Where do you give it? Um, do you dissent if you don't like the result of the policy that results from that consultation process? All of that is a challenge. Okay, now this is, there's some bullets here from the War College mission. So, what I want you to ask yourselves as you read the next few slides is, I, I'm going to submit to you all of this as uh, professional ethics questions, right? Viewed in the way we've been talking about. 
Can anybody pick out from these statements about the mission, what are the ethical pieces of this? Come on, guys, don't be shy. We'll start with the easy ones. Trust and confidence. Character. How about this stuff? Strategically minded, critical thinkers, proficient in joint matters. You're nodding, sir. What are you thinking? Okay, his point was that being, the ability to think strategically is the basis of the trust uh, of the civilian leaders and of the American people that you know what you're doing, right? Um, okay, how about this one? Sounds very bureaucratic, doesn't it? No. To execute cohesively and effectively, right? That's to do your professional work, to serve the client, to produce the result that you intend to produce, right? Good. Can everybody hear him? He uh, says, to match the tactical expertise with the strategic outcome, right? Um, that's, a, that's a critical question. Because we can be very, very good at tactics and not achieve desired outcomes, right? Uh, you can move stuff around brilliantly, but if you don't know where you're going. Uh, uh, how about this one? Again, the ability to do your professional activity on the international scene effectively, right? So that might mean, if we were serious about this, that developing your knowledge of other cultures is a professional ethical obligation, right? Or developing your knowledge of another language or your ability to work comfortably with coalition partners of diverse that behave differently than we do, right? All of that becomes necessary for the effective functioning of the profession and is in that respect an ethical obligation. Um, so all of these things I want to submit to you are about professional ethics, adapting the profession to meet emerging challenges, making sure that you're truly competent at what you do, and as Admiral Mullen stressed more heavily than anything else at this conference in DC, maintaining the trust and the connection to the American people. Uh, we, if we haven't got that, we're in serious trouble. So what are we going to do in this conference? First, we're going to talk, as we just have been, about officership as professional activity. And as I've indicated already, our next speaker, Don Snyder, is truly the, the, the dean and the expert of this and has led us all in thinking about that. So Don will talk for a while, then, then we'll put both of us up here and we'll engage with you in dialogue. And please don't be shy, because what's important is that you interact around this question and think about it. Um, so that'll be this morning. This afternoon, we'll hear from uh, Dr. Basevich and Dr. Rosenthal. Um, Basevich, as most of you probably know, is a retired Army colonel of the Vietnam era. Uh, he lost a son in Iraq. He's a professor at Boston University. He's written a very provocative book recently called Washington Rules, in which he argues that the sort of consensus opinion about how America should behave in the world, which is deeper than differences of political party, he argues, and is shared by the media as well as by politicians of all stripes is fundamentally wrong. That we should really think how we are behaving in the world uh, and radically rethink our global strategy. In dialogue with him will be Dr. Joel Rosenthal, who is the president of something called the Carnegie Council on Ethics and International Affairs in New York City. Um, they publish an excellent journal called Ethics and International Affairs. Uh, Joel has thought deeply about these matters and they run programs at their office on the Upper East Side of New York 
uh, four or five times a week. So everybody who's an expert on anything having to do with international affairs or ethics comes and speaks at Joel's organization and publishes. So that should be a very uh, productive dialogue between the two of them. Um, I've already mentioned we would uh, have a talk about new technologies. Dr. George Lucas from uh, the Naval Academy and the Naval Postgraduate School uh, has just uh, been the guest editor of a journal that I co-edited called the Journal of Military Ethics, uh, a special issue on emerging military technologies. All of these things that I already mentioned, robotics, enhancement of human performance, cyber war, so forth. So Dr. Lucas will speak to us about those technologies and what we need to be thinking about, about them. Um, the role of professional autonomy, dissent, and the broad question of civil-military relations will be, I think, a very productive dialogue between Lieutenant Colonel Milburn and Dr. Cohn, I've already mentioned. Um, and uh, Charlie Dunlap, who is the former uh, deputy TJAG of the Air Force, um, a very, very prolific author and a very fine speaker, will talk about the role of international law and how sometimes international law can be used in a manipulative way to constrain the warfighter in inappropriate ways. He calls this lawfare. He's now retired. He's a professor of law at uh, North Carolina. And uh, lastly, if he gets here, or if we have him by VTC, Brian Orend, who has written this excellent book on just war, will talk specifically about an area of just war that is historically quite undeveloped, but which he more than anybody else has brought to the fore. Traditionally, you remember just war is divided into use ad bellum, the justifications for going to war in the first place, and use in bello, the way you conduct yourself once you're in a war, uh, having to do with discrimination and proportionality and non-combatant immunity and so forth. Brian has, has worked hard to develop a third category he calls use post bellum. What are your obligations after conflict is over? Um, and he's worked it out very well as a theoretical concept. What I've asked him to do is to apply it very concretely to the situations we're now in, in Iraq and Afghanistan. What, what do you think our continuing obligations are um, to stay there, to go home, to get out, to, to do what exactly, uh, given where we are? Since we're up facing those decisions in the very near future uh, in both places, uh, it's important that we have a, a big dialogue about that. So uh, that's it for my kickoff. Are there any questions or comments? Great. Well, uncharacteristically, we're a little ahead of schedule, so let's take a 15-minute break and get back here at uh, 25 minutes of the hour, and we'll put Dr. Snyder on. <laughs>